Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Jesus Ramos Cottrell, assistant professor of musicology at the University of Oregon. His research covers the early modern period and more current analyses of globalization and merges music studies with social history, cultural studies, and literary theory. Prior to joining the UO faculty in 2022, Ramos Cottrell was assistant professor of musicology and ethnomusicology at the University of Connecticut. Professor Ramos Cottrell's monograph, Playing in the Cathedral, Music, Race, and Status in New Spain, was published by Oxford University Press in 2016. He edited the volume, Decentering the Nation, Music, Mexicanidad, and Globalization, published in 2020, which won the Society for Ethnomusicology's 2021 Ellen Koskoff Edited Volume Prize. In 2022, he edited a themed issue, Sound and Activism of Americas, a hemispheric music journal published by the University of Nebraska Press. In addition, Ramos Cottrell has served in different capacities in the American Musicological Society, the Society for Ethnomusicology, the College Music Society, and the Modern Language Association. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you for the opportunity. So first, tell us a little bit about your background. Where are you from? Well, I'm originally from Monterrey, Mexico, which is in the northeast of the country. And uh, I lived there for 21 years, uh, born and raised. And until in 1993, I went to Austin, Texas uh, to study classical guitar performance at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, while there, I just, you know, well, I, I still came with a cultural baggage of sorts in the sense that, you know, I was contemplating going back to Mexico to get a job, you know, teaching guitar, teaching music. But at that moment, uh, historically speaking, in the 90s, the notion of somebody working in academia in a Mexican university, especially in music, encompassed not just teaching music performance, how to play an instrument. It encompassed knowing a little bit of history, a little bit of music theory. So it was a holistic type of package uh, uh, for teaching purposes. I was feeling a little bit unsure about myself at that point, so I decided to pursue a master's in musicology as a sort of complement to my performance uh, profile. Uh, lo and behold, after two years, I realized that I was doing more time or spending more time doing research and reading than practicing my guitar, which I didn't want to let go of. But uh, at some moment, I have to make a very, you know, uh, conscious decision of pursuing a musicological degree altogether, if that's what I want to pursue professionally, and that's what I decided to do. So I pursued a PhD and graduated in 2006. And uh, after that came a series of jobs at different universities. And at this point, I've been in this country 31 years, longer than I was in Mexico. So you are an ethnomusicologist. Uh, I'm a weird doc. <laughs> uh, weird doc, okay. Uh, let's say that my upbringing was, in, my, my affiliation in grad studies was with historical musicology. Mm -hmm. But because of the type of upbringing that you know, I had and because of well, the effects that some events had in my life, NAFTA being one of the most important ones, I started to ask questions that you know, historical musicology was not answering, pertaining cultural production. At that point, ethnomusicology, at least at the University of Texas, was helping me intellectually to broach some of those issues. Uh, and that, of course, you know, made me question some things that I was doing in historical musicology. So that made me go into, you know, taking course, courses in history, medieval studies. So I'm not necessarily a historical musicologist, but I would not define myself as an ethnomusicologist per se. So when you started studying in other areas, like in history, and why why did you do that? What what made you go there? What were you looking for that the historical musicology wasn't providing you with? Well. Um, it had to do with my areas of study. Uh, uh, up until now, when it comes to my productivity, it's been in mostly two lines. One is critical analysis of race in the early modern period, particularly in the New World or the so-called New World, and more contemporary analysis of globalization in terms of cultural production. Um, and some people have asked me why that. Wh why is that? Uh, well, I would say that I would. I was not. I was not prey or sensitive while at Austin of identity issues. So that was not something that was really affecting me, although it did affect me later for sure. But 
Uh, maybe because of that, at that point, I was still operating on a certain sort of, you know, uh, how can I say this, mm, cultural imprint in the production of a Mexican subject, which up until 1993, I would argue, uh, gravitated around two main historical imaginaries. One is pre-Hispanic Mexico, mm -hmm. and the other one, modern Mexico. Colonial Mexico is as it never existed, right? It's the Spaniards, and of course, we are not Spaniards. So the construction of the we as a very important category of belonging uh, was still entrenched. So why that? Because as I was asking some things pertaining to globalization, pertaining to what NAFTA did, and I, I mind you, when I came to the United States, yeah, I was taking classes in American government, and we were having people from you know, <coughs> the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Economy, uh, from, you know, from Washington, our professor was well-connected, <laughs> uh, saying, well, what we need to do is to adjust, to learn new jobs, to place ourselves in a different market. And I said, well, in Mexico, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and culturally speaking, there was a point of tension in which certain music discourses became a point of expression for the socioeconomic anxiety of having a 40% rate of unemployment at that moment. Mm -hmm. So I started to ask more culturally best based questions, uh, and cultural theory was important. But then I said, well, what about, you know, my work on race in New Spain? Uh, should it be relegated to the music score? And if these scores or these music practices are mostly Spanish practices, what are we missing? And is this all really Spanish? So I started to look for tools in the Department of History, say, in terms of methodology, that we didn't have in musicology. Uh, in medieval studies, in the very, very sort of forensic, so to speak, study of sources, which we had to some extent in musicology, but then there was other, there were other questions that those people were asking in terms of, you know, okay, well, the manufacturer tells us something about, you know, the guilds of these people, the socioeconomic structure in society at the time when this artifact was made. And here we want to say, well, this note means this pitch, <laughs> and it's relevant to this feast in the calendar uh, for Catholic purposes. So one thing led to another, and I was trying to ask different questions relevant to culture, about a culture that was, of course, you know, gone by that time, but it was because of that reason. So let's talk first about that first book, Playing in the Cathedral, Music, Race, and Status in New Spain. So can you give us like a quick overview of, of the project of that book? Yes. It was mostly about looking at an, uh, an institution, the Cathedral of Mexico, as a place that was considered to be, of course, the Spanish institution that governed, you know, social and political behavior in terms of ritual, ceremony, and what, what have you music being highly, highly important as part of ritual practices in a confessional sort of, you know, society. Confessional meaning religion being the most important structure and element. So my interest in that particular book was to explore how music as an activity, as a know-how, as a sort of cultural capital, was a way for people of different backgrounds to seek affiliation with a Spanish institution to say we are part of a Spanish corporation, ergo we are Spaniards and we are trying to claim a space in Spanish society where corporate belonging was highly important for representation purposes. And why, why is it the, this, the period of New Spain that you focused on? The 18th century. Uh, that was a little bit of serendipity to tell you the truth. I started in, initially was about you know, studying music practices of the 17th century. The information was kind of scarce in comparison not because there's no information, no, but by comparison to the high proliferation of documented sources for the 18th century. That's why I started to gravitate uh, in that direction. And most importantly, I would say, because there was something about the development of the institution from an institutional and structural uh, vantage point that seemed to show that there was something of a backdrop, say, on the late 17th century that shows, okay, money is really important, like I always say, follow the money, <laughs> for the establishment of this place firmly in society, and it's in the 18th century when it really starts to struggle to position itself. And I wanted to know, well, musicians, as a sort of disregarded group, how are they fitting as a sort of corporation, as a group of musicians, in that moment of struggle, the first part of the 18th century. After the second part of the 18th century, it's a different economy altogether. There's more, I wouldn't say wealth, but there's a better management of resources. There's more income, and therefore, I wouldn't say profit, but definitely the amount of revenue 
is growing uh, in comparison to the first part of the 18th century where they're trying to really cope with the effect of you know bad agriculture tides were not being able to accrue as much capital as, we, uh, as you know as needed and mismanagement. There was a lot of speculation mm -hmm. with capital. Um, they were hiring people to do the finances, and those people used the money to speculate on their own. They only knew that at the end they had to produce a certain amount of money to the cathedral. And that issue of speculation, I mean, wow, capitalism is operating in a very interesting <laughs> way right here in a spiritual economy altogether. Uh, so the reason for the period, it was mostly about source material. Uh -huh. So say a little bit about that source material. What what, do you, what were you looking at when you were doing the research for this book? What were these documents? What were the, what was in that archive? Well, uh, initially, of course, it's uh, documentation about the lives of these people, right? Because if I'm trying to find, you know, the issue of corporate belonging uh, has been important. Well, the backbreaking part of doing social history is that you have to piece the lives of people because if you find a person, right, a name, whatever name and you find that they became admitted, say, in 1690, and by 1695, they had a salary increase, and also they have to be lacuna, and they appear once again in 1705. So you can spend perhaps five years of your life trying to piece together the life of this person, but that sample, is it that representative or something bigger? So the ability to have so much material about, say, Dif uh, different stages in the growth of people that came as children would allow me to follow the life of one person, which I will be able to document at certain stages with other people at that stage. So I would not be giving, I would not be giving continuity to everybody, but I would be giving continuity to the system of producing that particular type of subject, exemplified in one person, but with resonance at different stages in different people. And uh, it was that ability to find information about other individuals at different stages, which you know was highly productive for the 18th century. Hmm. Fascinating. So you spoke about this other track of your work, which is uh, in response to globalization. So let's talk about the second major project, which is the edited volume, Decentering the Nation, Music, uh, Mexicana Dada, and Globalization. So tell us tell us what the project of that collection was. What, what, what were you trying to get at? What did you want those essays to do? Well, initially it became, uh, I thought, uh, my fear was not to fall into the trite analysis of you know identity and globalization, right? And music as a discourse to express, here I am, look at this. It has been done a lot. So it was the so what type of thing. Something that emanated as a sort of you know question from playing in the cathedral was the issue of these people that are trying to claim a space in society as Spaniards, regardless of their ethnic origin. And I say that because, you know, at least in music studies, we tend to be very celebratory. Mm -hmm. We want to see we want to see black people, we want to see indigenous people but they want to see indigenous people doing indigenous stuff. We want right, to see right, black right. people doing black stuff, yeah. whatever that means, of course. Mm -hmm. So we tend to dismiss these people that were trying to negotiate the appearance of color or the ascription of color on the body for the sake of pretty much negotiating their position in society. Uh, and by the fall, of course, they, they end up reproducing certain paradigms of racialization and of power, ergo reproducing the structure of hegemony but at the same time, pretty much positioning themselves. It's a sort of complicity that I wanted to explore. In the center in the nation, I was trying to see if we could perhaps come not with a critique, but with a problematization, with a scrutiny of all of these categories of belonging that are appearing left and right under the paradigm of DEI, mm -hmm. which is the new paradigm for institutions to absorb difference and to create a niche of belonging so people feel, quote unquote, safe. So they can contain discourse and they can contain dissent. So Mexicanidad was a way of exploring the different ways in which different individuals, collectively speaking, find spaces, phenomenological spaces, to feel specific, in specific ways, to pretty much um, uh, mobilize the senses, you know, sensibility and whatnot, to create not meaning but meaningful space of belonging, which, because they acquire capital value, they are trying to be not controlled, but let's say that the state tries to have a stake on it for the sake of you know having a management on those collectivities, which at some point are marginalized, and then when they, they become visible, 
to become you know present right so there's a need to pretty much uh, manage civil society so the decentering of the nation is was about you know on the one hand questioning the power of the state to really ascribe well you know symbolic violence on you know on on individuals in the face of globalization but on the other trying to see that okay if we have different ways of considering what it, mean, what it means to be Mexican. Even within Mexico, where? In the Northeast, it's very different than in the South, very different than in the center, in the United States, or in greater Mexico as a whole. Being Mexican in, in California is very different from being Mexican in Texas. It's very different from being Mexican in New Mexico, for example. Mm -hmm. So the politics of it all invites us to consider that Mexican saying, you know, I'm part of Mexican culture or Mexican heritage is itself a very highly problematic label. Mm -hmm. So. In doing that, I was trying to s just uh, find a way to enter into a messy conversation that will allow us to see difference as a more productive mechanism for you know, establishing claims in relation to the state to create that sort of tension in a productive way, not for the sake of being iconoclastic or, you know, or activist, not yet, <laughs> not at that point, not in that volume, but seeing difference as something that once the state wants to intervene or the powers that they want to intervene, it's a moment to start negotiating a different type of difference altogether because mm. it, be, it can become another label altogether. Hmm. This is very fascinating because you're, you're trying to acknowledge, on the one hand, the kind of complicity that assenting to the identity of Mexican um, makes for that, that subject in relation to the state. And obviously the state wants to assimilate these subjects in a way that will buttress the state's power, so maintain the state's power. But you're, you're also interested in the agency of those subjects. You're suggesting that by that, that, that the complicity allows for some space for agency. How much space do you think that allows for? Does it allow for the transformation of the state? Is the state transformed by the agency of these assimilated subjects? Oh my God, I don't think I have, well, well I'm going to have to be audacious. But that's a huge question. Uh, I tend to be more on the negative side. Yeah. I don't believe that there's any possibility of, you know, liberation, mm -hmm. freedom. Mm -hmm. Those are very romantic ideals. Mm -hmm. But there's always, always something on the other side of the structure ready to take on that, to twist it around and to make you feel comfortable. The moment you feel comfortable, that's when something has been assimilated already. Right. So it is perhaps the exhaustion of difference that I really am looking into. Uh, because yes, I would, I would not say that symbols, identity is not, is not important. There are people right now in different parts of the world, not, as, not only in Mexico, for example, or in Latin America, that are really struggling for you know, essentialism, yeah. for any type of entrance into marginality. Because being marginal means you are inside, at the margin, but you're inside. Right, right. And there are some people that are completely not, I would not say that there's a way out of capitalism, but there are people that are completely out of any capacity for purchase power whatsoever. Yeah. Even at the level of uh, consumption, there's no way of entry. Dying is the only, you know, the only alternative mm -hmm. because they, they have no, uh, what is it, you know, no capital potential mm -hmm. of any sort, mm -hmm. at least to, to the structure. So um, I guess to answer that, I would say that for the sake of you know, representation, activism, agency, I think that you know, always looking for those points of tension is what we are perennially looking forward. But uh, how to teach that? Mm -hmm. That's the other question that I don't think I can broach at this moment. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you, uh, in the Decentering the Nation, you weren't yet considering activism. The next project, the next major project, is this edited special issue of America's a Hemispheric Music Journal, which is called On Sound and Activism. So tell us about that project. Well, that was an invitation uh, by the editor-in-chief of the journal. And it was, excuse me. That came because uh, at that moment, when I was contacted, we were still, uh, all of us, undergoing, of course, you know, the effects of, you know, COVID, uh, re realizing that, you know, in way, the different ways in which we were trying to cope, showing the inequity of, you know, everything. And of course, uh, the George Floyd murder was still ringing very, very close um, 
uh, in the ears of a lot of people. So for that reason, I was approached, and somebody approached approached me. I'm sorry, from endomusicology with the most uh, anodyne, well-meaning, enthusiastic <laughs> ways, saying, "What about all of those, you know, all of those uh, manifestations uh, about hip hop and um, and others that are about, you know, celebrating music for its potential for representation?" And, and that's when I started to go celebration. <laughs> Maybe we should twist this all around a little bit. And I said, well, I'm willing to take on this if I'm allowed to really curate the volume a little bit because I think it should be more about finding ways in which we can create responses. Because if somebody wants to say, well, this is identity, music is created in this way of representing people, and the things remain the same. So if there's no material effect whatsoever, then why to do something that has been done before? I didn't see the point. Mm -hmm. And we receive a, a quite a few submissions on, uh, of that sort that we have to say, well, this is not really the volume for this. Um, and I try to focus as much as possible on the ones that were actually making agentive sort of interventions. Mm -hmm. So that was the main, the main goal, to find points in which activism elicits a response. And I was, of course, playing metaphorically with the, uh, with the word, and that's not, that's not, I, cannot, I cannot claim uh, originality for that uh, strategy between a response and being responsible, responsibility. Um, so what type of responsibility or response is necessary today to pay heed to the you know, expressive points in which people are asking for representation or asking, perhaps not for representation, but to pass the stick for the listener or the reader to do something. What type of reader are we in need of today for something to be catalyzed beyond the text? It was a highly, perhaps, um, I'm going to say this, idealistic situation, you know, asking for someone to take action after reading. But that, that was the type of movement through reading that I was trying to, you know, go for. And uh, in doing that, well, of course, I was highly inspired by, you know, people like Ayat Spivak, who have been doing have been for that for a long time. Uh, but yeah, I was trying to, at least in music studies, to go away from this celebratory rhetoric. And uh, the interest was that intervention of some sort, whatever that sort is. But making sure that the uh, reader or the listener, in this case, is acutely aware that it is them who is, you know, on which the responsibility is placed. Mm -hmm. So if you can get that after you read that, you know, okay, you're talking to me. Exactly. What can we do? Because it's very easy to say, I publish this volume, I got my icon, my check mark, you know, I put it up for tenure review. As readers, what can we demand or ask from, you know, from people? That was the whole intention with that uh, activist volume. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting in the sense that, um, it made us aware, at least, of some of the projects in which some people are, uh, are getting involved and how much the issue of symbology should be a point of contention because it is symbology at its core, which is at the very point of negotiation, once again, when we have ritual practices, which, you know, ritualized, you have ritual, it repeats, if it repeats, it creates meaning, it carries meaning, it becomes a symbol in performance of sorts. Uh, is symbology something that allows us to create complicities with other people through feeling, through phenomenology, for that symbol to lose that meaning and create another one? But that loss is important. And that's something that a lot of us that are entrenched in identity don't want to understand. It's okay to let go because maybe there's something that has to give way for something else. It's about creating a space that only and other another generation is going to be able to exceed. Some of us are going to die in our ways, <laughs> uh, at our age, uh, but some of these people right here are ready to take something. Maybe we cannot live the same economy that we had, maybe we cannot live the same you know, uh, culture that we had, and maybe it is good that we cannot live that anymore. Yeah. So, so you're talking about these other people, not us, yes. but the students. So you're a teacher. Yes. So tell us about what happens in your class. Tell me about a class and what happens in there. Well. Uh, what I've been trying to do uh, so far when it comes to these particular subjects or topics mm -hmm. is to try to create a situation that really positions the student inside, subjectively, with their upbringing, with their, with their biases, with everything. You are there. Um, and that's, that's been a challenge here in Oregon, I must say. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a challenge everywhere, but it is a, different, a specific challenge here. 
uh, because say in the East Coast there there is an immediate sort of moral impulse of people that want to say well uh, I'm white right okay but I'm not this so how can I be different so it's about entangling or disentangling rather I'm sorry the epistemology around color that is not about color it's a set of corporate attitudes and behaviors really here everybody is doing good everybody's moral by default <laughs> and that's another problem <laughs> because uh, I'm not doing anything so creating a space for students to really position themselves and these discourses is something that is really really important and making them aware that you're taking this class because you have to be aware of brown store brown stories or discourses maybe this is not a class for you we I don't want to talk about you know uh, decolonization or decolonizing anything because it's not possible to go around the fact that we have already been traversed by power, traversed by coloniality, and we have, be, we have been produced by power already, all of us. And some of us, I must say, are even savvier than a lot of you at the colonial discourse itself. So it is that positioning to create that point of awareness that we are complicit, and that the moment that we're trying to do good, we are likely going to reproduce some evil somewhere that is something that I try to do in the classes in different fashions of forms of course successful in some cases unsuccessful in others but let's say that at this point the challenge the huge challenge has been once again agency what can these people take outside mm -hmm. so among your many activities and achievements and this is of particular interest to me because I'm an English prof is your participation in, and I understand your chairing of, the Committee on Academic Freedom and Professional Rights and Responsibilities of the Modern Language Association. That's the Professional Association of Language Teachers, like me. So tell us about the work of that committee and how you got there as an ethnomusicologist, as a musicologist. Why did you wind up in an MLA committee? Chairing it, right? You're chairing it now, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which one you want first? <laughs> Whichever one. Whichever. Well. Uh, let's say, I think I started with the second one first because it will be into the, into the first one. Going to teach in Dallas, Texas really messed me up. <laughs> because the real question on, on identity was not about being Mexican. It was about being, about being a modern subject of sorts. Mm -hmm. About the idea of progress. Mm -hmm. That if you cultivate a work ethic and you produce something, you're going to get somewhere. With NAFTA, that, everything collapsed in Mexico about that completely so I was immediately put in a position that I had to find a way means to pretty much be able myself alone without asking for um, because I was a national uh, national person of Mexico at that point I was not a Mex an American citizen without asking for loans of any sort shape or form so working full-time to be able to pay tuition room board clothes books everything that was still possible it was a different economy it was not possible it's not possible anymore but creating that work ethic allowed me to see, at least in the States, that if I did A and I went to B, C was a consequence. When I went to a certain part of Texas, or the great state of Texas, that changed dramatically because I saw privilege firsthand. And honestly, coming from Mexico, I only thought, being a middle-class person, that not now we'd say that and now they come from privilege. I saw privilege in the face. Uh, I didn't know that that amount of wealth and uh, in some cases waste was possible. And uh, more importantly, the whole curriculum was geared towards satisfaction. So when they ask you to address students as customers, you start to question a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And when the workload is asked to be reduced, so students are happier, content, you know, success, the dirty word now then something is really working wrongly. And, I st and when people really told me, well, you know, some, only some people work. And they told me that straight out. That made me question a lot of things that go at the core of your being. And that made me question, why am I doing musicology? You know, music, who cares about music? It's another commodity in the market. So I started to question even deeper things, maybe thicker, as thicker questions. And neither ethnomusicology nor, uh, nor historical musicology had any answers for those things. So after the publishing of the first book, I played in the cathedral, uh, I started to ruminate with those things as I was putting together the idea for the center in the nation. But I had no tools, you know. I, I really was s struggling 
so I started to read more critical race theory because I was working with difference a little bit at that moment. And there was one quote from Gayatri Spivak. Do not ask me what quote that was, but <laughs> just the voice. It was piercing. And it was a footnote, mind you. <laughs> so I said, I have to read more of this. And I started to get more engaged with her work. Um, I started to pretty much watch every lecture that is available of her in YouTube. Um, and I started to realize the, what reading was. And we can go into that issue right now because ChatGPT has changed everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but reading, I realized that, you know, okay, yeah, I need different intellectual tools, different resources, great. But when I started to read, say, of grammatology, uh, halfway through I realized, well, if I haven't read Kant, if I don't know Hegel, if I don't know Freud, I'm missing a huge part of the argument here. And I started to, okay, I'm going to close this book and I'm going to start reading those things first. And then Spivak says, but do it in German. <laughs> okay, well, little by little, work my German back, <laughs> painfully, but surely. And then a different type of breath opens up with every single argument that has been made. It's just, you know, the breath is different. Maybe you're reading one page, but that page is so rich. It's a type of reading that I had not known mm -hmm. until there. For me, reading was, you know, read a text, you know, be critical, highlight, write notes, but thick reading. She taught me, she taught me how to do that. And it sounds um, highly ignorant of a professor to say that. That's how I knew how to read. Mm. And uh, that's how I, how I started to read from that point on. Uh, I have not touched some of her books because I still lack some other texts that are necessary for me to, you know, bridge those things. But after reading Hegel, Marx was completely different altogether. Mm -hmm. After reading Hegel and Marx, Freud is completely different. So it is, once again, the type of complexity you, that you begin to see in the operation of human consciousness and the human mind that started to open not channels for answers, but for better questions. So it started there. It started with that search. It started with, with Spivak's work. And it started to, you know, to lead me into the construction a little bit, but with a different type of reading altogether. And uh, by, the t uh, by the time I was in uh, the University of Connecticut, 2017, I was doing more and more work. I had not done any output whatsoever because I was just absorbing a different way of thinking. And uh, I guess until two years ago, I produced my first article since for a while. And I started to reflect that new way of thinking. And it's definitely very different from how I was writing before. Um, in 2019, I said, well, I said, these people, you know, for, the, for whom a lot of people, they, well, they have groupies. <laughs> They're human beings. Yeah. So okay. they must have their own powwow. <laughs> and it was the Modern Language Association. So it was in Seattle, and I attended for the first time. And uh, I did what I never did before. In musicology, we have our American Musicological Society convention every single November. And people, you know, the, the saying in the society, you do four papers, you do, your, you, you do your chore, you do your duty. From 8 in the morning until 6 p.m., I was going to sessions nonstop. I will find one that maybe I didn't like, but every single session otherwise was highly, highly, highly productive for me. And when you have someone like Judith Butler as part of the Q&A, it's a different Q&A <laughs> altogether. So I, I started to attend since that since that moment, you know, I've been doing it now for five years, I believe. And uh, my, uh, my second year, I said, well, I want to get more involved with these people. I want to I want to talk about those things in that way. So I have to get involved with those people you know, somehow. I have to seek involvement. I don't know how. So I look at the committees that they have and there were a couple for which I could qualify because, you know, I'm not in literature. It's not my field. And I said, well, okay, well, academic freedom. So let's put my name over there. They didn't call me the first time. The second year they called me, I said, yes. And lo and behold, I did not know that it was gonna be by far the most labor intensive committee that I have ever been <laughs> in. Uh, especially during these times when academic freedom has been under assault left and right. Uh, about that, I, I would just say that, you know, until last year, I would, we would feel in that committee like we were like Bruce Lee fighting Chuck Norris in the Colosseum, very slick, very nice. But this past semester, you feel like Jet Li fighting five dudes at the same time because attacks are coming from 
every possible direction. So it's been highly, highly intense, highly intense. And um, I don't know, I started to just, you know, be involved, talkative in the meetings. Uh, the meetings are twice every year. They are four hour meetings. <laughs> they are very long and very thick because, you know, we have to engage with a lot of things. And sometimes in the middle of, you know, of our meetings, uh, not in the middle of the meeting, except, but, you know, during this the academic year, something happens for which we have to produce a statement. Mm -hmm. So we start to produce, you know, memoranda, referenda, or whatever, that are a means prov of providing language for people that are fighting the hard fights on the ground in their institutions. And language has become very, very, very important because like in every political situation, is the first thing that people try to apprehend. Arrest language, stop language for the agenda of the institution to be carried forward. Language has been something that we have focused on and um, we hope that we have been influential to some extent. Uh, there have been at least, uh, at least one instance that I can say it in which we were, you know, we were productive um, in relation to a high, prof uh, high profile institution. Uh, but yes, it's been mostly about producing language resources for scholars. And because of that involvement, last year, the, I used to receive, <laughs> I received an email from the executive director saying, you have been nominated to serve as chair of the committee, will you accept? And I said, well, I want to say no because I'm scared of death, <laughs> but why not? Let's give it a shot. And Lo and behold, I was handled the, the stick when the hardest things were beginning to, the, to unfold. So here we are. Here we are. Um, Jesus, thank you for that service that you're doing for the MLA and for all of us who work in the academy. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. We're out of time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I've been speaking with Jesus Ramos Cottrell, Assistant Professor of Musicology at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>